Then homosexuality. Lots of people say people are born homosexual. They may be born, born with a homosexual demon in them, but that's not being born homosexual. I had a letter just recently from a Baptist pastor who had deal, been dealing with a young man, a Christian, who came to him and said, Pastor, I'm tormented. I had this thing in me, and I don't want it. And the pastor sat in front of him and quoted scriptures to him for about ten minutes, and suddenly the young man lurched sideways out of the church, collapsed on the floor, and was delivered. And he rose to his feet and walked up and down in the office saying, Thank God I'm free. Thank God I'm free. Thank God I'm free. I have all the sympathy in the world for homosexuals, but I don't believe they need to stay homosexual. The church can welcome them, provided they change. Paul said to the Corinthian church, Such were some of you. Not are some of you, but were some of you. Jesus has the power to deliver on the section. Dear brother and sister, if you meet Jesus, you cannot stay the same. You can become religious, you can join a church, you can do all sorts of things and radically be unchanged. That's the problem with these people. They deny the power of God to change people radically. That's why Churches are now admitting homosexuals and ordaining homosexuals. You know the reason why? They say we have to have compassion. I agree, we have to have compassion. But then they say well, there's no way to change them. That's the lie. I believe in admitting homosexuals and ordaining them if they've been changed by the power of God. Ruth and I have a friend in Central Europe who's a descendant of the Moravians, thank you. You know about the Moravians? Probably the most significant group that's ever emerged in church history. I won't go into that. Anyhow, he was a dancer, and most professional dancers are homosexuals. He was a well-known homosexual in his particular society. He met Jesus, and Jesus changed him. Today he's married, has children, and is pastoring a church. And he's one of the most loving people I've ever met in my life. He's rightly ordained because he's been changed. The problem is, and this time I think I can use the word problem, the problem is that the people who are ordaining homosexuals are not realizing that Jesus can change people. He changes lots of other people. He changes liars. He changes cheats. He changes people who are greedy and jealous and spiteful and malicious. It isn't just homosexual. Our mistake is to make a, an exception for homosexual. See, this is exactly what Paul said. They'll have a form of godliness, but deny its power. The power to change people radically and permanently for the better. Now, this is a very sensitive issue, but it's very important. So I want to give you just three passages from the writings of Paul. The first is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know? And I find that where Paul says, do you not know, most Christians today don't know. <laughs> when he says, brethren, I would not have you ignorant, most Christians are ignorant. It's surprising. It's gone on for 19 centuries and it doesn't seem to have changed much. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, and those are first of all the passive homosexual and then the aggressive homosexual. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. So God is not excluding anyone in that category, provided they're changed. But, he says, these are beautiful words, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. But you've been changed. I'm all in favor of admitting prostitutes, homosexuals, murderers, drunkards, everything, if they've been changed. But it's unscriptural to admit them unchanged. And we have a right to demand the evidence of the change in their lives. 
Now notice what Paul said, because he uses this phrase in three places. He says, such will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's one thing to be born again and enter the kingdom of God. It's quite another thing to inherit the kingdom of God. A lot of those who've entered will never inherit, because they're in these categories. A woman, a very fine Christian woman, came to me with real grief. She said, we just had a letter from my son who's at college telling us that he's been homosexual from the womb, that he was born a homosexual. So I began to talk to her and I said, when you were pregnant with your son, did you do anything that's auto? Well, she said, yes. I tried to divine whether it was male or female, boy or girl. I had a pendulum suspended in front of my womb and I knew if it went one way it was a boy and went another way it was a girl. I said to her, you exposed your unborn son to a demon by what you did. That's why he's homosexual from birth. Now she's a very solid Christian woman. She understood, she repented. And I believe in due course her prayers will bring deliverance to her son. But let that be a warning to you. You cannot fool around with the occult in any form or shape. And if you want a further definition of the occult, it's in my book. The next question, is homosexuality a demon? Besides prayer, what can I, his natural sister, do for a homosexual, alcoholic brother? I believe myself homosexuality is always demonic. And beside prayer, it's difficult for me to tell what such a person can do without knowing the situation. Is it possible to testify personally to your brother, to instruct him out of the scripture? Will he listen to you? I can't tell. But I'll tell you one thing about homosexuals. Normally, it's hard to get them to renounce homosexuality with all their heart. That's one of the reasons why they're hard to deliver. And I have seen homosexuals, both men and women, delivered. But in most cases, it does not come till they recognize that thing as an evil spirit and specifically renounce it as an evil spirit. In Matthew 17, 14 to 21, the disciples could not cast out a certain demon. Jesus said they couldn't because of their lack of faith. But why did Jesus say, How be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting? Well, now you'll find that in many of the more modern versions, the words and fasting are omitted because they're not found in all manuscripts. But in any case, I'll point this out to you, that Jesus on that occasion did not go away and fast. He went straight to the demon and cast it out. He had already fasted. And I personally believe that fasting is a part of scriptural discipline for every believer. That no believer is walking in the fullness of God's provision if he does not practice fasting. The next question, is homosexuality a demon? Besides prayer, what can I, his natural sister, do for a homosexual, alcoholic brother?